episode 24 of The Comic Source. I'm your host, Jace. The big news today, Marvel held a press conference talking about some details for their Secret Wars crossover coming later this year. And basically, from what Tom Brevoort and Axel Alonso said, it kind of sounds like this is going to be Marvel's version of Crisis on Infinite Earth. So they're not going to totally reboot the universe. They're not going to start everything over with issue one, but... They're certainly going to have an amalgamation of all their different alternate realities uh, going forward. So a way for them to kind of clean up some things they don't like. Maybe a way for them to bring Wolverine back from the dead. So we'll keep an eye out for more details. And as the story of Secret Wars unfolds, we'll definitely see a new version of the Marvel Universe coming later this year. Now the title I'm going to talk about in this episode, Rom Space Knight, is one of the first comics I collected where... I followed the story month in and month out. I was sure never to miss an issue. And that started with issue 48. And I went back and got the back issues and kept collecting until it ended with issue 75. So issue 1 was released by Marvel Comics December 1979. And the series ran for a little over six years. The final issue was released February of 1986. A little background about ROM Space Knight. So what had happened was Parker Brothers, who are known for producing board games, had decided in the late 70s to get into the action figure business. But at the last minute, they kind of started hedging their bets, and they decided to produce this toy, ROM Space Knight, as cheaply as possible. So they took out most of the points of articulation, and they changed the glowing green eyes to red because it was cheaper to produce. At the end of the day, they basically shot themselves in the foot. It, it ended up being a, a very poorly received toy, and it wasn't very popular, and ultimately it was a flop. But in the meantime, before the toy was released, they had licensed Marvel to produce a comic in hopes of boosting the sales of the toy when it was released. Marvel turned to one of their go-to writers in the late 70s, early 80s, Bill Mantlo. Now, Matt Lowe, as some of you may know, is responsible for creating the super popular character right now, Rocket Raccoon. He also had extended runs on The Incredible Hulk, Micronauts, which was another licensed toy property for Marvel. He also created Cloak and Dagger. He had a long run on Spectacular Spider-Man, Iron Man, Alpha Flight. So he was really one of the go-to guys at Marvel in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. So what Matt Lowe did is he took this idea of just this ROM space knight, this lone figure, and he created a very rich backstory for him. Instead of just being a robot, he came up with the idea that Rom was a cyborg from a, a planet called Galador. And this was kind of a peaceful, paradise-like planet. And they were attacked by a race known as the Dire Wraiths from the Dark Nebula. So this peaceful, paradise planet didn't really have a way to defend themselves. So they asked for volunteers to undergo this process where some of their living tissue would be grafted into these very powerful mechanical suits of armor. And Rom was the first to volunteer and is considered the greatest of the Space Knights. So this idea of being half man, half machine is a running theme throughout the entire run of Matlow's Rom Space Knight. Rom very much, after hundreds and hundreds of years in this suit of armor, uh, wishes to re reclaim his humanity. It's definitely a point of contention. It adds drama to the series. Just a brief overview of the series. The series starts out, we see in issue one, Rom has come to Earth. We learn that he and his fellow Space Knights defeated the Dire Wraiths on Galador 200 years prior. And in that 200 year period, that's taken Rom to travel to Earth. And he's been kind of out there looking for Dire Wraiths who fled to different planets throughout the galaxy to kind of establish a new stronghold and rebuild their ranks so they can attack Galador again. Now this is another theme that runs throughout the 75 issues of Rom Space Knight. Rom's nobility and the responsibility he feels to defeat the Dire Wraiths once and for all. So I'd say the first 40 issues or so, they're either one and done or two part stories and we're starting to get a feel for who Rom is. We get a feel of his nobility. His uh, identity is not widely known on Earth and he often comes into conflict with the authorities because whenever he banishes a dire wraith to limbo because he refuses to kill, what's left of the body is ash. Now I should mention that the dire wraiths are shapeshifters, much like the scrolls. So for any outsider looking in, when Rom trains his weapon to banish these dire wraiths to limbo, it looks like he's murdering humans. So that causes a lot of problems in the early going. As I said, the first 40 issues or so, Rom's kind of just getting his footing, learning about Earth, and he makes his base of operations in a small town in West Virginia where he first 
came to Earth called Clairton. Uh, the citizens there come to believe in Rom and his cause, and Rom sort of feels at home there. Right around issue 48 or so, the series really kicks into high gear. We see that the wraiths actually have almost two distinct species, the male and the female. The male uses mostly science to try to accomplish their dastardly goals, whereas the females are sorceresses and they use wraith dark magic. And right around issue 48, they kind of have a falling out. The females wipe out the males and decide that they're going to only use their sorcery from here on out because the science has failed them. And so the series definitely takes a darker turn. Instead of imitating humans and possibly imprisoning those they impersonate, these female wraiths instead destroy the person that they impersonate. With the use of these stingers, they absorb the memories and the appearance of those they wish to disguise themselves as. And I really feel like at this part of the series, this story becomes much more compelling. With issue 50, it starts what's known as the Wraith War, where Rom's existence becomes widely known on Earth. He makes contact with a lot of other heroes. The Wraiths are making this last desperate attempt to bring their planet into our solar system and replace our Earth with their Wraith world. And life on Earth, as we know, it will become extinct. And instead, Wraith world will become the Wraith's home planet here in our solar system. Ultimately, in issue 65, with help of other heroes on Earth, we finally see that Rom is triumphant. He manages to defeat the Wraiths once and for all. And with issue 66, he actually leaves Earth and attempts to return to his home planet of Galador, where he hopes to restore his humanity. So the last 10 issues of the series are about Rom's journey home and his attempt to regain his humanity. In addition to the 75 regular issues, all scripted by Bill Matlow, there were also four annuals that were also scripted by Bill Matlow. And annual number two is a, is a particular favorite of mine because it features the Space Knight Squadron. So it was a chance for readers to meet other Space Knights and see their abilities and how different their armor looked. And it's just a really cool issue. Now to talk a little bit about more about the writer on the series, Bill Matlow. As I said, he was one of the go-to writers in the late 70s and early 80s for Marvel. He was very prolific and unfortunately in 1992 he was involved in a hit and run accident while he was rollerblading in New York City and unfortunately he's unable to take care of himself. Some of you may have heard that Marvel reached out to Bill last year and gave him a special screening of the Guardians of the Galaxy because as I said he was the creator for Rocket Raccoon. So that was certainly great to see a nice move on Marvel's part. However Bill's care is extremely expensive so I'm going to put a link down here in the description and if you want to go and donate to help with Bill's ongoing care I'm sure him and his brother would greatly appreciate it. Now the art on the series from issue 1 through issue 58, the pencils were done by Sal Buscema and he inked himself for the first 19 issues. With issue 20, Joe Sinnott came on and took over the inks for Sal. So even though it's the same penciler, the art style kind of changes uh, with issue 20. Likewise, when Ian Aiken and Brian Garvey take over the inks with issues 34 to 50, again there's a slight shift in the art style. And I feel this is really the sweet spot for art in the ROM series. The inks by Aiken and Garvey are, are amazing. What they managed to do is really lighten the line that Sal Buscema uses. Uh, traditionally, Buscema uses a very heavy line, which gives a lot of power to his characters. But sometimes the style can come across a little blocky. And it makes the emotion in the character's face a little harder to read as well as making the panels a little static from panel to panel so the storytelling suffers slightly. With issue 59, the great Steve Ditko takes over and he finishes out on pencils through the end of the series with issue 75. I'm not sure Steve Ditko was the best choice uh, on pencils for this. You know, his stuff on Amazing Spider-Man when that series started is just classic stuff. But a lot of that is due to the style of Steve Ditko fitting Spider-Man very well with these weird, awkward poses, which really dovetailed well with the lithe, thin figure of Peter Parker. Rom is a, a much more powerful figure, especially with the armor, so I'm not sure that the poses that Ditko uses for Rom sometimes are the best choice. Another thing I feel about the art on the last 15 issues or so is there's not a consistent inker on the Steve Ditko art, so sometimes when you get an inker who puts more of himself into the work, like Bob Layton or John Byrne, it works out well and the book still looks beautiful. Other times, Tom Palmer or P. Craig Russell are inking Steve Ditko. The art style is much more kinetic and free-flowing, and so it's a little inconsistent, but with Matt Lowe telling the story, it certainly makes the book still worth reading. One other thing I should mention about the art is the huge list of amazing artists that did covers for this series. Frank Miller did the cover for number one and did a few other covers throughout uh, the series. Al Milgram, Michael Golden, who was the primary artist on Micronauts with Bill Matlow, Dave Cockrum, Bob Layton, Joe Jusco, 
Bill Sienkiewicz did quite a few covers, Mike Zeck, Butch Geis, John Byrne, Paul Smith, and Jim Starlin. They all contributed covers to the series. I'm pretty sure if you showed a lot of these covers to people who were collecting comics in the early 80s, they would recognize them. Maybe they aren't overly familiar with ROM, but they would certainly recognize some of these iconic covers. Also, I should mention that the pencils for ROM Annual Number 1 were done by Pat Broderick, which I really appreciated because, although I love Sal Buscema on the book, because pretty much him and Ditko did the entire run, it didn't give a lot of chance to see someone else's interpretation of ROM, so seeing Broderick do the, the pencils on Annual 1 was a pleasant surprise, and he does a great bang-up job of making Rom look regal and cosmic. So in preparation of doing this little retro review, I actually went back and reread the entire series, issue 1 to 75, and all four annuals. It took me a lot longer than I expected. I'd forgotten how much more dialogue and text and exposition were in these comics back in the 80s. It's certainly a far cry from the books of today, where there seems to be more of a focus on the art telling the story, rather than filling the pages up with so many words. I'm not going to say I prefer one style over the other. The books that come out today are certainly beautiful to look at, but there's something to be said when you can read a book in five minutes, as opposed to when I went back and reread these. Some of them took me 30 minutes just to read one comic. So these are certainly books from another time. They're very much of their age, but I believe they hold up well, and the classic story of Rom is something that's worth reading. Unfortunately, because Marvel doesn't have the license, they can't reprint any of these. And in fact, I believe Hasbro has a license for Rom now. I don't know if there's any plans to bring them back. There have been rumors here and there over the years that they're going to reprint the series or perhaps come out with a new series. That sure would be great. I know there's a lot of guys in my age that read comics in the early 80s that have a very soft spot for ROM. It would be great to see these books reprinted for the comic audience of today. I'm not sure what it would take for us to see another ROM series. I don't know that it would come from Marvel or from someone else. As I said, Hasbro has a license for ROM, but everything else, the backstory, the other Space Knights, Galador, all that was created by Bill Mantlo, as I said. So Marvel actually has the rights to everything in the stories except for ROM himself. So if you're looking to read a fun story from the past with a big sweeping cosmic story where the focus is on the actual story and not as much on the art, I highly recommend reading ROM Space Knight. Most of these issues you can find in conventions and comic shops for 50 cents or a dollar each. They're not expensive. I think putting a whole set of ROM together would be something fun that you could do. They're relatively easy issues to find. And since no comic book company currently holds the rights to produce ROM Space Knight, we're not going to see reprints anytime soon. So the only way you're going to get this story is to go out there and hunt for it. And I feel it's certainly worth your time. So once again, I want to thank everybody for watching. Join me next time when I talk about the best comics of 2014. I'll see you then.